sold like hotcakes the world over and was well loved by all pilots who flew it. I think this was largely because it was a very forgiving aeroplane. And in its day, it had outstandingly good handling qualities. It had good climb, good acceleration. Extremely good maneuverability. Combined with this, it had a wide track undercarriage. It was very forgiving of crosswinds and bad handling by some pilots. So it's made its mark internationally as what is known as a real pilot aeroplane. that the country is short of modern military aircraft. Already delivered in substantial numbers to the Air Force, the fighter suffered from engine trouble at high altitude when its guns were fired. However, steps have been taken to eliminate this trouble altogether. A development of the swept wing P-1052. The Hunter is said to be better in every respect than either the American Sabre or the Russian Navy. To become the successful aircraft that it eventually was, the Hunter had to undergo a long and difficult development phase. And this isn't too hard to understand, considering that it first flew only 12 years after the maiden flight of the first jet ever. The problems that the early hunters experienced were many. Amongst them were radio reliability, canopy misting, and an inefficient air brake and too little internal fuel capacity, limiting flying time to 50 minutes. More serious problems were experienced with the armament. Firing the four extremely powerful 30mm Aden cannon had a number of unexpected effects. cracks in the surrounding structure, gases piling up in the front fuselage, and the links and cases that were ejected damaging the underside of the fuselage and the air brake. But the biggest problems were caused by the RA-7 Avon engine. When the guns were fired or during certain maneuvers, the compressor surged, resulting in a flame-out. The fact that this problem was only discovered on a standard production F1 was due to a silly coincidence. Hawker had carried out the armament tests on the third prototype, which was powered by the Sapphire, an engine that was virtually surge-proof. It remains a mystery why Hawker preferred it to the Sapphire, which was more powerful and technically more sound. It wasn't until the new Avon 200 series in the F6 that Hawker's choice proved to be right and the Hunter got the engine it deserved. Some of the F4s in these pictures are already equipped with the so-called Sabrinas, the blisters on the underside of the fuselage that collected the links of the Aden ammunition. As uh, the hunter proved, it turned out to be a very successful aeroplane but of course it lives uh, with a reputation of some of the early problems that were experienced with it. Development went on until eventually all the early problems were solved. The wing's leading edges were redesigned and the wing itself received a number of hard points, allowing external tanks to be carried as well as an impressive array of weapons. New external stores were tested on the Hunter, such as the Fairy Fireflash air-to-air -air missile which wasn't accepted. A commercial opportunity came up in 52 when NATO decided to sponsor the acquisition of a modern European fighter. 
An American team of pilots, amongst them Chuck Yeager, evaluated the Hunter against the RAF's favorite at that time, the Supermarine Swift. I think the Hunter was obviously more maneuverable because it had a low wing loading and a very good thrust to it. The Swift went in for a um, reheat system and they had very major problems, indeed one with longitudinal control, two with surge problems with the um, intake engine combination that they were using, and uh, its maneuverability at altitude left quite a lot to desire. It was evaluated and did not get very much popularity. The T-7 was powered by the Avon RA-21 Mark 122 with a static thrust of 7,425 pounds. Basically, this was still the original engine, but with considerable improvements. The aeroplane that was presented by Bill Bedford was the Mark 66, equipped with the Big Avon, a 200 series RA-28 providing 10,000 pounds or 4,510 kilos of thrust. The Hunter had very straightforward spin characteristics, however trainees were not allowed to provoke a spin on purpose during a solo flight, although as these pictures show, recovery action wasn't very complicated. Recovery action, full opposite rudder with stick forward and central. We'll do some more next sortie. Now take me back to base. I applied opposite rudder, fed the stick for a crack of spin aileron, the spin stopped instantaneously, and I had this great feeling of professional pride as M and Airfield was in front of me. Seconds later, I found the ground was abnormally close, and I was pointing vertically at it. I selected max lift flap, fed on power, pulled to the edge of the buffet in the full knowledge that I was probably going to run out of altitude. The situation got a little less worse, and then I realized that I was going to make it with a few hundred feet to spare, let the aircraft go down to treetop level, pulled up, rolled, landed, taxied in, stepped out of the airplane with a smile on my face as if that was part of my normal display, and never told anyone about it till 18 years later. My problem was very simple. The ground over which I was spinning was 500 feet higher than the airfield, and because I'd done an unorthodox letdown into M and airfield, I hadn't reset my altimeter, which just goes to show that even a monkey can fall from a tree, and I very nearly did. Mm -hmm. 